Dr. Rutcher for stepping in and showing the movies to me, Your Worship. And also to Rebecca for again uh, playing to me. Thank you, too. As usual with the pandemic, a picture of the congregation is required. If you are a visitor, please give your name and contact details to your steward. And would everyone please wait to close of the service to leave the building at the steward's direction. Should you require the service of the minister this week, please make contact in the first instance with myself. Sincere thanks again for all the generous donations to the food bank and those already received to the shoe box at Amy. The last day to return a few boxes is 14th of November. A fortnight is gone today. We meet, God willing, uh, round our Lord's table next Sunday. Then an announcement for elders. The Roots Presbytery Elders Fellowship will meet on Monday, the 8th of November, Monday week, at 8 p.m. in Kilrath Presbyterian Church. The speaker will be Vic Hill, Discipleship and Leadership Development Officer at CCM. Then it is with the first on sadness that I read a message from our Minister Nancy. Dear Regional Sir Thomas, I have hoped to be here in person to communicate this information to you, but circumstances have prevented it. Recently I applied for early retirement and it has been granted. My last Sunday here would be the 28th of November if all goes well. This is not the end of the ministry I would like, but we all have to be with the circumstances we find ourselves in, with the help of the Lord. It has been a privilege to be the minister of Bush Mills Presbyterian Church. And we have made many friends and endured much support from the congregation, which we will never forget. I would especially say thank you for all the love and support we have received since Tom took ill. Please continue to keep us in your prayers. I pray the next chapter in the congregation's life will be a time of blessing and growth. It's not easy to pick up after a pandemic, but we do not work alone. We have a great God who will lead and guide in the right path. May love, much love and blessing to you all. Later in our worship, we will be praying for Nancy and Tom, the family and this congregation at a time of great change. Clark Sesh and I were talking prior to worship, and ultimately, we depend on God alone, and He will guide and strengthen and uphold. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. Let us worship God. We sing together our first praise, Guide me, O thou great Redeemer. <laughs>
Let us pray. Father, there are times when the message that Jesus brought strikes home, and we live as you ask. We overcome uncertainty and embrace the life you offer us, but more often, we make our own plans and assume that you will be happy with them, but we never ask. And when those plans come crashing down round our feet, we blame you and we're angry and surly. We come today to listen for the way you want us to take and the people you want us to be. For your plans for our lives, your love is strong and relentless. Empower us to make the changes we need to make and to know the assurance of your presence with us. For we live in a world of a bewildering complexity. We come to refocus our lives as we struggle with change. Some changes are slow and evolving. At other times, change is lightning swift and we are disorientated. You alone are the one unchanging feature in the landscape of our lives. We come to be encouraged and renewed by our encounter with you. For you are the giver of life and hope. Help us trust in your generous love. We are aware of the fact that we have fallen short of what we hoped for ourselves. But in the midst of our questions and concerns, you reassure us as to our value and remind us how much you love us. Help us look back and give thanks for your goodness. You've given us family and friends who have invested so much of themselves in us. We give thanks for laughter shared problems wrestled with, tears shed, and good times experienced. We give thanks for warm homes and food on the table, for clothes, and for all that we so easily take for granted. We give thanks for the hope that all that is destructive will not have the last word. You come to us in Jesus to rescue us from ourselves and our own choices. You remove from us the threat of backs broken by the weight of past failure. As you offer a new beginning, we're overwhelmed by all you promise us. And yet though we come with thankfulness and praise, we recognize our sense of failure. We confess that we have not been radically changed by the good news of Jesus coming. Our lives have been dominated by our own anxieties and concerns and we have been indifferent to the needs of others. We have not been supportive or sympathetic and we have criticized rather than courage. Forgive us for selfish lives in which we have sought our own ends rather than listen to your word of possibility. We're called to share the promise of love and forgiveness. For we build walls rather than break them down. Help us leave behind all that prevents us fully being your disciples as we commit ourselves to live in the life of the Spirit of Christ. For in his name we pray, using the words he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Testament reading is the book of the Psalms, the eighth Psalm. And I've chosen this as our reading from the Old Testament, bearing in mind that COP26 begins today. For in many ways, the future um, of the direction that we're going to take as a whole world in dealing with global warming will be discussed, but hopefully, decisions reached. 
the eighth psalm describes God as the creator and also our role as stewards. Let's hear the word of God. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Because of your enemies, silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, crowned with glory and honour. You made him ruler over the work of your hands. You put everything under his feet, all flocks of herds and the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, all that swims, the paths of the seas. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name. girls, I have brought something to show you this morning, and I'm sure you recognize what it is. What is it? A boomerang. Well done. I wasn't even looking in your direction. A boomerang. Well, I want to tell you about boomerangs. Do you know what, a, what country boomerangs might come from originally? Australia, you're right. Although, funnily enough, I was doing a bit of research on boomerangs, and I can tell you that boomerangs aren't only found in Australia, they were also invented and used in ancient Egypt. But we associate the most, as you say, with uh, Australia. They were used for hunting by the Aborigine people, the original inhabitants of Australia and they used them as long ago as 20,000 years which is a long long time now do you know that most boomerangs don't come back not even designed uh, to come back most of all we think about boomerangs you throw a boomerang, and I, I really think that I could have a go at throwing a boomerang today and see if it comes back to me in the pool. Uh, but actually, the truth is that most boomerangs weren't designed to come back. Now, if you're as old as I am, you might remember the story or the song that Rolf Harris used to sing, My boomerang won't come back. My boomerang won't come back. I'm a disgrace to the Aboriginal race. My boomerang won't come back back well. Most boomerangs weren't designed to come back, they were designed to take birds in flight or animals. Next fact about boomerangs, you get right-handed boomerangs and you get left-handed boomerangs. Now I happen to be left-handed and being left-handed actually is a bit of a, a, a problem sometimes because we live in a very right-handed world. Very difficult to use scissors to job with if you're left handed. Oh, you can get left handed scissors. But boomerangs, you can get left handed boomerangs and right handed boomerangs. And if you're throwing a left handed boomerang, you throw it clockwise, that way. And if you're doing a right handed boomerang, you throw it that way. Do you know? Although they've been around for the last 20,000 years, boomerangs need the same skill to make as a modern aircraft designer designs the wings of aircraft. It has to be exactly the right size and weight and shape if it's to do its job. Especially the one that you have to throw and hope if it doesn't hit its target, it comes all the way back to you again and you're able to grab hold of it. Boomerangs. Some of them are designed to 
come back to the person that throws it. I want to think about some of the other things that can come back to us. Sometimes unkindness, if you're unkind to somebody, that can come back to us and hurt us. Or if you're selfish, always putting yourself first, that can come back and hit you. Or telling a lie gets you out of a problem, you think. But then the lie comes back and hits you. <laughs> but then so do good things. If you're kind, Sometimes that kindness can come back again and enrich your life. Or if you're loving and forgiving, same thing. It can back, it come back to you and helps you. Jesus said this, the measure that you give in life is the measure you get. So if you're going to be unkind and untruthful and selfish, it'll come back to you again. But at the same time, if you're kind and loving and forgiving, that will come back also. Let's say a prayer. Loving God, you have shown us in your Son the way you want us to live. You want us to be kind and loving and forgiving. And you've told us that when we're that kind of person, that's what we will meet in life. People will be kind and loving and forgiving to us. But if we are unkind and untruthful and selfish, it'll come back and hit us in the future. So help us follow the life that you've shown us in Jesus. For in his name we pray. Amen. One thing I should tell you about this uh, boomerang. There are instructions that says how to throw it properly. But I think I'll leave it for another day. I may be outside. <laughs> I'm going to sing uh, your hymn, which is I am so glad that Jesus loves me.
Testament reading is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, the 19th chapter, uh, verses 1 to 10. It's the story of Zacchaeus, tax collector. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there by the name of Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. <coughs> when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give you half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of everything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save what was lost. May God bless to us these readings of his word, and to his name be glory and praise, time with the end. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal God, first and foremost, our prayers this morning are for our minister, Dr. Nancy, and for Tom. We pray for Tom as he is in hospital and ask your strengthening grace the power of your love to surround him and your gift of peace we pray uh, for Nancy as she copes with Tom's serious illness we pray also for Jennifer and David Tom's children that they too may be surrounded by your love. And we pray for your healing. But we remember before you that Tom's illness and his stay in hospital has resulted in other issues that have had to be faced by Nancy. We remember her desire to be here and to talk to us as a congregation about her impending retirement. Remember all the pressures that she faces at this time. And we pray for your kindness that we will be a strengthening people that we will understand the reasons for her decision to retire. That we will wish her well. That we will uphold her and Tom in our prayers in the days that lie ahead as other decisions have to be taken we pray for the Kirk session of this congregation who will have added responsibilities in the days that lie ahead as under your spirit they will guide the congregation through a time of vacancy we recognize all the challenges that have to be we recognize that ultimately all of us depend <coughs> on you and your grace alone. We pray for Her Majesty the Queen, for her commitment to the service of our nation, which continues at an age when most of us are long retired. We remember her inability to come uh, to Northern Ireland because of doctor's suggestions that she rests and that has now taken into a longer period of rest and recuperation. We pray for her and we remember the burdens that she carries with the loss of Prince Philip this year after 70 years of marriage and the daily pressures of being head of state. <coughs> May she know your grace. We pray for the nations of the world that gather.
gather in Glasgow today for COP26, facing huge and difficult choices in which individual nations may well be thinking that selfishness is the way forward for them, while other nations take the hard decisions of cutting CO2. We pray for the discussions that will take place, that as a united world, decisions can be made that will result in this earth, our home, your gift to us, being sustained in the long term. This past week saw a budget in Westminster where we made spending decisions as a nation. We pray for many families making ends meet and finding it a struggle, especially with a huge rise in fuel prices, who face weekly difficult decisions we pray for those who get into debt, which often spirals out of control, and those who feel excluded. Loving God, our community continues to face challenges it has never faced before. The health service is under significant pressure, and doctors' leaders are warning of the real dangers that head our way as winter comes. Every aspect of the health service is under strain. Waiting lists grow. So we pray for those who work in the health service, in hospitals and in the community. May they know your strength and grace. And we pray for those who are ill and their families. For we have become aware of the frailty and uncertainty of life. And how much we depend on others and how much we take for granted. We pray for those who are bereaved and lonely. Those who hide their true feelings that we may have insight and grace to understand and respond. We pray for the depressed and the anxious, the insecure and the frightened. We pray for ourselves that we may know your guidance. Amen. The praise I stand amazed in the presence.
former congregations went to Queens to study law. Law like medicine and dentistry. Because they lead directly into a profession are very competitive to get into. You're talking A's and A stars. And he was bright enough and he got in to study law. And approaching the end of his course, I asked him what was his plan now. He had applied to do the professional qualification for barristers and had been accepted. Now, I have to let you into a secret here. I received a call to ministry early, but while pondering the nature of that call, I thought about other things that I could do with my life. And one of the things that I thought of doing was doing bar law. And you may well think that I was a great loss to the legal profession. <laughs> Here was a friend traveling the path that I might have chosen. I talked to a church a couple of weeks later. I said, well, what about things? I've been accepted to do bar law. I said, fabulous, great. He said, I've turned it down. I'm going to be a tax inspector. A tax inspector? I said, <clears throat> you don't explain that each tax district had an inspector and he was going to be fast tracked into that role of a tax inspector of a particular district. But why on earth would someone who is offered training as a barrister choose to become a tax inspector? And what that really means is that I wouldn't have wanted to be a tax inspector. And I've got to say, there's nothing wrong with being a tax inspector, but it just wasn't the vision that I had for my life. I don't think Zacchaeus's parents had the vision of him being a tax collector either. The system worked differently then. The Romans discovered it was better to put the right to collect taxes in a given district up for auction. People put in a bid to collect the taxes in a given area. And then they made their profit on top of their bid. They were disliked by the own community because they were collaborators with the Romans who were hated. There was a whole bureaucracy of tax collecting. At its base level, there was a booth in the street collecting taxes as people came into a city, for example. Matthew was one. He was sitting in his tax booth when Jesus came along and called him to be a disciple. Then there were middle managers. And at the top of it all, was a chief tax collector in an area, and that was what Zacchaeus was. And all these tax collectors, from the man on the street in the booth, through the middle management of the tax collecting system, through the chief tax collector, they all took a cut. Jericho was a thriving city. It stood as the gateway between the Middle East and the Far East, it stood between Jerusalem and the very fertile areas of Judea and Samaria. If you were in the business of collecting taxes, not only taxes on people, but taxes on trade in an area such as Jericho, well, it was impossible to find a more lucrative franchise than the one in Jericho. Zacchaeus was a very, very wealthy man, despised by his own people. All because at some point he had decided to enter into collusion with the hated Romans. Like Zacchaeus, we all start with innocent dreams for our lives. But somewhere along the way we discover it is very easy for us to compromise what we say we believe. <coughs> we end up doing things we never dreamed capable of doing. 
We run into financial difficulty and we steal from our employers. Or we knock away at the confidence and undermine the confidence of a fellow worker that we regard as a competitor. There are stresses in our relationship with our spouse. We have an affair. Or we justify it ourselves. It was all their fault. We do something that we know is wrong because we don't want to face up to the consequences of saying no. Now, which of us does not know the power of compromising what we say we believe? Following a leader we do not respect. Being part of a community of friends is often hurtful. Which of us doesn't know about staying in a bad relationship or finding ourselves in collusion with the system and saying yes when we're dying to say no. We know all about this. As soon as you say yes to some things, you've begun to sacrifice something of yourself. That's why sometimes at the end of a long day when we look at ourselves exhausted in the mirror, we wonder what on earth has happened to me. We are all Zacchaeus. One day the word spread through time that Jesus was coming. Everyone was talking about a blind man that he had healed at the gates of the city. People were pouring out into the streets to greet this amazing Saviour who could restore people to what they were meant to be. Zacchaeus too wanted to see Jesus, but he was small and he knew that people weren't going to make room for him. He would be stuck behind the people who were taller than he was and he would miss the parade. But this time he refused to miss the chance to see Jesus. And he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree. So imagine the scene. This wealthy man. People knew he was wealthy by how he was dressed. Maybe he pulled some kids out of the tree so that he could scramble up into it. Then he could have a view and see all that was going on when Jesus arrived. Just to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Was he so desperate to see Jesus? He wasn't hungry or sick. He was not blind like the man that Jesus healed. Or was he? Not by accident, but took, Luke tells us the story of Jesus healing the blind man and then immediately introduces Zacchaeus, a man who could not see Jesus. Like Zacchaeus, we have long heard of Jesus, the one who lived without being complicit in the ways of the world that demean and destroy, who does not take, but it gives, who uses power not to oppress, but to heal. We know he can free us to be fully alive and restore our humanity, and we do not want him to pass us by. We don't want to lose him in the crowd. So we try to climb as high as we can to find him. Zacchaeus climbed into a sycamore tree. We climb our way through school and work or university. We climb from one achievement to another. We try to climb out of our problems by venturing onto thin limbs. In search of more money or greater acceptance. But it's never long before we realise that we're up a tree with all our anxieties. We thought we were moving up, but we've just placed our lives in a precarious provision that leaves us afraid most of the time. And we live with regret over some of the choices that we have made. And we realise that we cannot undo some of those choices. Afraid to try again. 
So we find ourselves fulfilling roles rather than truly giving ourselves to others. And we are as lonely as it is. We eventually discover that we cannot climb our way to salvation. Zacchaeus thought he was climbing to his salvation as he climbed into that tree. But it was actually Jesus who saw him up the tree. And we spent a lot of our time up a tree trying to build a tree house to make ourselves more comfortable. But we may be comfortable in our tree houses, but we're still up a tree. Jesus said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry down. I must stay at your house today. It's very rare, incidentally, for Jesus to use that word, hurry. He confronts the case and tells him to come down from the tree. And Jesus confronts us. And tells us to come down from the tree in which we find ourselves. <laughs> Come down from your illusions and your unhappy compromises and your comfortable misery. Come down and get your feet firmly on the ground. Hurry down, Zacchaeus, I must stay in your house today. According to the text, Jesus wants to spend time in our homes. Like Zacchaeus, we have to decide whether we are going to take Jesus home or not. The text tells us that Zacchaeus welcomed Jesus, and that's the only way to respond to the offer of salvation. Don't keep pondering it. Don't keep mulling it over. Don't keep asking your questions. Do not even think about trying to get Jesus to climb up into the tree with you. Hurry. Climb down. Welcome the new restored life that Jesus offers. And Zacchaeus' life changed immediately. He resolves to give half of all that he owned to the poor because they were the people that he hurt most. And if he defrauded people, he said he would pay back four times. Now, the mouths is difficult here. But what it means is that Zacchaeus was not going to be a wealthy man at the end of it all. Well, maybe he was wealthy in one sense. He had recovered his own life. And maybe that was worth more than anything. Maybe he's now wealthy for the first time. This is a powerful story about the making of the most heroic choice that you can make with your life. Shakespeare said, this above all, to thine own self be true. And then it follows as night the day that thou canst not be false to any man. The gospel goes deeper. It claims you cannot find your true self, let alone be your true self, until you climb down from the tree of your anxieties and compromises and welcome Jesus and take him home. <coughs> the only way to make the changes that your soul has been yearning for. It's the only way that you can be true to your mission <coughs> of serving the kingdom of Christ. And for his name, his power and the glory. Time will it end. We live complicated lives. We are like Zacchaeus. We've heard the story of Jesus. We love to get a glimpse of him. We recognize that we've climbed into the trees of our anxiety and compromises and we don't know how to get out. And then we hear of Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to home with you today. I'm going to stay with you. And that's good news for us. As Jesus said,
says to each one of us, come down. I want to go home, stay with you. May each of us accept that offer. Amen. Our final prayer is the church's one foundation. <coughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.